Hello and a very warm welcome to today's webinar on finance options and instruments for ecosystem-based adaptation, an overview and application of relevant finance sources. Um, this webinar um, kickstarts a series of webinars to exchange experiences on how to finance EBA measures. It is organized um, for the International EBA Community of Practice, um, which is facilitated by GIZ, the global project mainstreaming EBA on behalf of BMUB Iki. My name is Alexandra Köngeter. I'm advisor to the Global Project Mainstreaming EBA, and I will guide you through today's session. Um, before we start, um, you are all muted, muted but um, if you face um, problems, please use the chat function. Um, we have a short look on the agenda for today. Um, the first thematic input will be um, on an upcoming publication um, by Climate Focus and GIZ. It's on financing EBA measure and giving us an in, uh, introduction and an overview of EBA re relevant finance options. Um, Tobias Hunza is going to do this um, kickstarting presentation. And afterwards, we have um, um, first country experiences from Mexico and um, um, Fernando Sequeira is going to present how to engage the private sector in coastal ecosystem and EBA measures and sharing experiences from the Caribbean coast. Um, just some housekeeping with Saba meeting. Um, as already said, you have all been muted um, by the organizers and um, you have different um, ways um, to engage um, in the discussions. Um, on the right hand side, you have a control panel and there's a um, text box for questions. So there you can um, type in your questions and send them to all um, the participants and then the organizers will see the questions and um, come back to you personally or also to the whole audience afterwards. If you don't have um, the option to type in your question, for example, um, because you are following today's session um, from a, a mobile device, please raise your hand and we will um, um, yeah, unmute your microphone. So this would be the second way, but we would um, encourage you to use the chat function since we are many participants today. Um, please be aware that this webinar, um, as well as also other webinar sessions for the International EBA Community of Practice, um, is being uh, recorded and made available on Adaptation Community Net, where you will find it on the subsection Ecosystem-Based Adaptation and there under the folder Webinars. And with this, I would already hand over to um, our first um, presentation from Tobias Hunzai. And Tobias, you have now the floor. Yes, thank you, Alexandra. Also a very warm welcome from my side. My name is Tobias Hunzai. I work with Climate Focus from Amsterdam. And uh, the presentation I'm uh, going to give is dealing with financing ecosystem-based adaptation measures by providing an overview of EBA-relevant financing options. This is a reply to the expression of interest from the EBA community of practice to uh, explore the, I think there was, yeah, to explore uh, financing sources and instruments relevant for EBA measures. So the GIZ implemented project mainstreaming EBA that uh, Alexandra just introduced that is funded by the International Climate Initiative uh, commission climate focus to uh, draft a report that investigates these financing options. The report aims to deconstruct financial engagement opportunities in the context of ecosystem-based adaptation and it highlights uh, various finance dimensions by showcasing 10 EBA finance case studies. This topic while not necessarily new, comes at a crucial time with ever more relevance. 
um, the nationally determined contributions or NDCs that are submitted by parties of the UNFCCC spell out the actions that countries intend to take to address climate change on a domestic level, both in terms of mitigation as well as adaptation. And a recent study, study from IIED and IUCN shows that 24 out of the currently 167 submitted NDCs representing 189 parties um, explicitly mention EBA as a crucial strategy to address uh, adaptation and climate change on a domestic level. Another 85 NDCs include an ecosystem-oriented vision for adaptation, which uh, represents together almost two-thirds of all uh, parties to the UNFCCC that include natural services as a crucial uh, adaptation strategy. If we correspond that with uh, the current availability of finance, a recent study from United Nations Environmental Programme um, assesses the adaptation finance gap um, currently uh, by uh, presenting that the global public finance that is currently being available and invest, invested is two to three times less than what is needed at the uh, current moment. And it offers a prediction that over the next decade, uh, this, will, this finance gap will even widen um, by uh, quite a big margin and a factor from between six and 13 times higher. And um, it can already be said that this is still a conservative estimate. So this highlights the, while there is a great need and a request for adaptation strategies that include also ecosystem-based adaptation, um, there is a need for scaled up adaptation finance. Going into the research that uh, the report provides, there were two main underlying questions which had to be answered. The first question asks about the definition for relevance. If we ask what are EBA relevant finance instruments and sources of funding, what is the definition of the relevance that we're looking at? At the same time, um, a question arises what common factors and characteristics uh, influence EBA financing strategies. Regarding the first question about the relevance for finance sources and instruments, uh, it can be found that all sources, all financial sources, that have an interest in investing in ecosystem-based adaptation measures can be deemed relevant and the same accounts for all financial engagement instruments that can support and help to effectively disperse funds to EBA measures. The second question um, asks about the commonality for EBA, of the EBA finance environment for the multitude of dimensions that activities uh, engaging with ecosystem-based adaptation around the globe face. And it was found that generally EBA uh, solutions tend to have a limited ability to generate uh, revenue that is enough to sustain its own operating costs, yet alone to be able to repay capital investments which were necessary in the beginning of a project or activity. This often leads for project developers to explore innovative financing approaches by, for example, blending different sources of finances and fusing finance instruments um, according to the needs and the appropriateness of the activity. However, a lack of revenue does not mean that um, an EBA activity has, is lacking additional value. I believe that everyone that implements and communicates the need to include natural services and adaptation strategies can express the, 
the value, the overall value that the approach bears. So what do we mean when we talk about value? Um, Ecosystem-based adaptation has biophysical effects, economic and livelihood impacts. It may have social and institutional outcomes um, and even change in people, changes in people's knowledge, attitudes and practices. So these values or these benefits or the value can be translated into benefits and impacts of a measure. And when we look at um, this as a currency, we can approach and engage with different financial sources that share an interest in supporting exactly uh, these benefits. And using this uh, assessment and being aware of these benefits and impacts, it is possible to arrive at a targeted communication with uh, potential financial sources that share the interest in supporting uh, the same objectives and in investing into these ecosystem-based adaptation activities. There are generally two cost categories that project developers encounter. One being investment costs associated with the developing, uh, the development of infrastructure and technologies, um, usually in the development phase of an EBA measure, and these are often grant-based. And the second a category of costs, which are uh, operating costs and rely to ongoing expenses during implementation um, of the life cycle of an activity uh, usually relating to, for example, human resource costs, communication costs, maintenance or administration. So when we start to deconstruct the financial considerations that surround the multitude of possible EBA activities, we can distinguish between four general source categories by origin. There is international financing sources, domestic financing sources, public and private financing sources. These can come from different places. So international, uh, international public finance sources such as multilateral funds or bilateral donor cooperation um, can be a financing source just as, for example, also private international financing sources um, that where, where an activity engages with a certification scheme or a market debt provider. But for an activity, an EBA activity, to be able to interact with those financial sources, so to financial, financially communicate with these sources, um, there need to, there's the need for a suitable financial engagement instrument. There's also, again, a multitude of instruments to choose from that have been tested and engaged with in different contexts. Um, some of these instruments are more um, suitable for, for example, um, public sector engagement, such as grant financing or concessional loans where it's more usual, but other instruments cater more to the needs of the private sector. Um, and other instruments are actually well suited to facilitate the interaction between uh, public and private financial sources and instruments. So with this toolbox, we can also try to exemplify in a generic scenario what this could mean for a uh, an actual scenario where for the different phases of the setup of an uh, activity um, certain sources and um, instruments are being approached. In this generic example or scenario I um, international public finance source, a bilateral donor, um, is providing a grant to finance the inception and design phase 
uh, of an activity, usually for, in this case, uh, for the duration of three to five years, while then going still into an institutional setup phase where together with a domestic public finance source, in this case, a municipal budget, um, um, a, an infrastructure is being created where an endowment fund is created that allows for the oversight and transparency to then in an activity implementation phase uh, approach domestic private finance force, in this case uh, individuals and businesses that pay for services they render through fees and payments for ecosystem services. Another exemplification that is slightly different in this case, um, the provision of a risk insurance, whereas uh, private business offers risk insurance policies to, to households. Um, this is being guaranteed and secured through a domestic public finance source, uh, for example, a green bond. Uh, that has generates shares, shares of proceeds and can be used to leverage and guarantee the, the, the risk insurance provision. In another step, if the incentive structure is set up in this way, it can also incentivize uh, the individual households that uh, buy those policies from the risk insurance to invest into their own adaptive capacity um, and therefore lowering their premiums towards the uh, insurance provider, for example, by taking out uh, a microfinance loan or through private capital that is being available, available at a market debt rate um, in that country. In a final slide, and to bring things together, the report assessed and uh, arrived at some overarching recommendations. If we visualize ourselves or vis visualize that the value that is being generated by an EBA activity through its benefits and impacts it generates, then it is crucial that an activity also provides transparency transparency towards those who have invested into the activity to support exactly those benefits and uh, and impacts for to allow for stakeholders to trace the utilization of the investment and participation and activity to also allow ownership over the process this often requires to measure and report or at least to assess and report the achievement of the activities that are part of leading towards the objective of an activity and that are being financially supported. And this helps to establish uh, a trustworthy relationships with investors that are keen on showing the results through their investments into an activity and to be able for themselves to showcase towards their own stakeholders that they've they are contributing um, towards these benefits. So if these considerations and also an efficient use of funds is being guaranteed, for example, through limiting overhead costs so that the operational expenditures are being kept low, then this might even allow for the scale up of an activity by attracting new commitments from investors and increasing overall the impact that an activity can achieve. Thank you very much for your time and attention. I think uh, there will be time for some clarification needs and also later for a, a, a broader discussion. Thank you very much. Yes, 
Thank you very much, Tobias, for um, your presentation. Um, I think we should open uh, right now the floor for a first round of questions. And since we are much more than 100 participants in today's webinar, um, I would ask you to use the chat function and not to ask to be unmuted. Um, so on the, your right hand side in the control panel, you see a window and um, the option to, um, to type in your questions in this little box and to send it to all and um, then um, we will um, read your questions um, in a loud voice. So I see there are the first questions. We're just waiting some seconds to allow participants to type in their questions on the right hand side. Okay. So um see some questions coming in. Um and um we're just starting. Okay, I start with this question um, from Hannah Reed. Thank you very much, Hannah. Can we have some sense of where most EBA currently comes from and where you see most opportunity opportunity lies in terms of securing further finance? Um, Tobias, please, um, could you switch on your microphone again? Yes, thank you for this question. <clears throat> so, I um, can't really see the question. So if I understand it correctly, uh, the question it's about uh, the current sources of or the, the landscape of financing being available for EBA um, in quantity. And if I understand this question correctly, um, it's not so easy to, to answer. So first of all, those financing sources that are being tracked through indicators on a global scale. Um, there is still a political disconsent about what constitutes climate finance, let alone if you have, if you can trace adaptation finance, then to uh, distill uh, the EBA component out of this. Right now, it is my impression that um, international public financing sources for the overall concept of EBA and implementation and piloting of activities around the globe play a major role. Yet, I also get the impression from looking into different examples of activities around the globe that maybe what's not on our radar right now while well, not on our radar right now because we can't really measure it on a global scale. Also, private investments into uh, by households or communities into strengthening the adaptive capacity just by engaging in with uh, with markets by uh, um, taking out microfinance loans, etc., um, already constitutes a large source of investments that are being made individually and on, on a regional level to strengthen the adaptive capacity by engaging also into natural services, which uh, could be defined as ecosystem-based adaptation. Okay, thank you very much, um, Tobias, for answering these questions. I will just go on uh, with the next one. Um, from Johannes Karemans, um, which of the many international funding initiatives apart from the Adaptation Fund use EBA as one of their potential lines of financing? Thank you, Johannes, for your question. Yes, this is a very good and relevant question. I think one major fund um, that is expected to provide finance for adaptation in the future is the GCF, the Green Climate Fund. And the Green Climate Fund has one of its core um, support aims to um, finance ecosystem-based adaptation 
around the globe. Um, there have been, from the few projects which are being funded right now, or that have been approved by the GCF board so far, there's also um, one that has a genuine uh, EBA component and another one in that's in the Gambia, uh, I think by UNEP, and another one in Madagascar, which also relies strongly on ecosystem-based um, adaptation. So the GCF will play a major role in the future. Well, I think that the Adaptation Fund, also under the Paris Agreement framework, um, will continue to play a major role as an international fund to provide finance for EBA. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Tobias. One more question, this time from Ethan Evans. It seems like uh, reliability is a cornerstone of financing instruments for EBA. Ongoing operation costs need to be covered to protect net investment. How do we balance risk and reward in securing ambitious but robust funding over a project's lifespan? Lifetime, sorry. Thank you for your question. This is also a very good question. And uh, it depends. At the uh, And I think this is also an excellent discussion topic um, where I can only offer my opinion. And uh, one difficulty or challenge in assessing um, financing for EBA or talking about the topic is that the reality for activities can differ so much in their interaction um, with financing institutions uh, and uh, financing sources can differ so much from one another that it's hard to make um, claims of uh, one, one size fits all solutions. Um, I would say that well, we've looked in depth, for example, in, a, in an um, example from or in a case study from Morocco where a foundation is basically trying with trial and error approach in um, approaching different financing institutions. They receive grants, they uh, um, carbon credits, uh, other certification schemes, um, donations, etc. And for them, the uh, core currency that they described. Um, as being most um, important in their interaction with financing sources was that they can showcase the impact that a financial contribution makes towards the aim um, and that they're being reliable. So I do believe that reliability, if I understand this in the context of your question correctly, um, is absolutely crucial uh, to build a relationship with financing sources uh, that prove the test of time. Okay, thank you very much. Tobias, I would take just one final question before we start with the presentation from Fernando, who's already in the line as well. Um, so um, there's a question on how strictly EBA and ECODR are separated nowadays in the funding streams and how flexible it is from William Colin Brander. Thank you very much for your question. I did not perceive, like, I, I don't feel um, that I can um, confident, like, that I can be absolutely certain in answering this question. Um, maybe uh, someone else um, can, is better suited to ask, answer this question. Um, I did not come across um, that th this separation um, was absolutely necessary um, or, or demanded, but maybe someone else can, who, who, who can uh, answer this question, can also maybe write into the um, question or chat function, and uh, I can maybe after this follow up with 
you, Willem, on, on, on this question because it's it's an interesting question that I was to also would also be interested in following up on. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Tobias. Um, and this is also a perfect, your last sentence is also a perfect trigger to the final part and how to exchange further our knowledge on financing EBA. But we'll come to this point at the end of the webinar session. And with this, I see Fernando is already in the line. Um, Fernando um, Sekaira from TNC Mexico, um, very welcome to the webinar. And uh, I would like to give you um, the floor for the upcoming, for the next presentation um, on your experiences in the Caribbean coast with financing EPA and engaging the private sector. Um, Fernando, I see your microphone. Yeah, it's switched on. I hope um, everything is working. Fernando, you have the floor. I will go through your presentation once you say next slide. Okay. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to present our experience here in Mexico, in the Mexican Caribbean, as you said. Um, to how do we work with different stakeholders, in particular, that you are interested in the private sector here in the Mexican Caribbean. So um, I'm going to talk ab about how we involve the um, private sector, particularly the hotel industry, involved in the protection of the coral reef uh, in the Mesoamerican Reef. So. Um, we are working on rescuing the reef because they protect our beaches and they protect our infrastructure in the coastal area. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide. Yeah, okay. So we are testing this approach here in Mexico, particularly in the area near Cancun and Puerto Morelos, where we use our, 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 as our ground because we have valuable assets. There are like 100,000 rooms in the area and is the most important tourist destination for Mexico. It's at high risk. We have uh, hurricanes uh, hitting the area, like Wilma and Emily and, and Ernesto in the last 10 years have destroyed and caused millions of dollars in, in damages to the coast and to the economy. But also they have a natural protection. Coral reefs, sand dunes, and, and also other systems like mangroves protect the coasts. So we have the three characteristics of the area that make this area as a perfect uh, site to test our approach. Okay, next slide. And next slide. Yeah. So first, first we want to demonstrate that this is true. What I, what I am saying that the, that, the, that the reef actually protect the coast. The most important asset for the tourist industry is their beaches. Um, obviously, everybody here and the, to the Caribbean, they come here because they have these beautiful beaches, but they are being eroded. And, but here we can see that the, we have the science that demonstrates that the reef protects the coast. The, the, there's a lot of information about it. Uh, next slide. And the, they also protect the, the infrastructure, the, hotel, the hotels, the restaurants, the roads and everything. So when we know that the reef actually protect the coast. Uh, also we use uh, coastal engineering modeling, oceanographic modeling, economic modeling. So we make these alliances with the non-conventional uh, partners with us because the coastal engineers were actually, I mean, it's a different sector. So we calculated that the, if we lose, continue losing the reef, I, I, as they are going, that, that's happening right now, the losses to the hotel industry will increase double or three times, depending on, on the type of the storm. So we convey this information to the hotel industry. Next slide. And as we also convey something that it, it was surprising that they, they were not fully aware that we are losing our reefs. We already lost in the 1970s 80% of our coral reefs in the area. They have been degraded by different reasons, by uh, diseases, by bleaching events, um, by algae growth, and also by hurricanes. The hurricanes uh, cause uh, severe uh, impact on, on, the, on the coral. So we can see here in these pictures how the corals used to be in the perfect uh, uh, pristine situation, but how there are many of them already being degraded. That has increased beach erosion, particularly, and that's what the hotels see every day. They are suffering beach erosion uh, all days, and they are suffering the hurricanes and from time to time. And they are already investing millions of dollars in trying to uh, protect them 
from that beach erosion. So they are already spending money on that. They are aware of the problem and they want to do something. Okay, next. Um, but the, also we give a solution. I'm saying yeah, you can do something about the reef. You, you can just wait there. So you can restore the reef. There are sexual reproduction asexual reproduction you can use hybrid solutions using some artificial structures to actually regain the height the rugosity that the reefs needs so here we also use we, we combine the coastal engineers science with the reef ecology i mean how to recover the reef height using I mean, living material like the corals but also um, using the concept of the coastal engineers to build like a dike, I mean to rebuild the dike in front of the of the hotels and reduce the risk they are having Next slide. So we make this alliance with different partners. I mean, we, particularly the government, the, the national uh, entity of protected areas who is responsible for the reefs, the state government, um, and, and all the science community that were involved in this uh, uh, initiative. Continue. So we have all this solid background to actually do this. I mean, so the first component uh, to reduce right risk to people and economies uh, and using natural system and financial systems was this solid science that we have. They show effectiveness. We have developed some pilot projects in different sites in the Caribbean but also here in Mexico. We build capacities and we build some financial instruments in this case. Uh, so I'm going to more, focus more on the involvement of the tele industry in the financial instruments because here is where they they can play something because they have the funding as i mentioned they were spending millions of dollars in reducing the beach erosion and moving them to a trust fund to a risk transfer mechanisms and, and so forth and next slide so we were asking i mean who is interested in restoring the reef uh, who could help us to set up the trust and who will buy an insurance for the reef because the reef are uh, at risk similarly as the uh, as any asset is at risk from, from the hurricanes. So we, we assess, yeah, the tourist industry, the communities, the government, and the fishermen. But actually the, the industry, the tourism industry is the one who has the resources. They are providing the jobs, it's a $10 billion economy here in, in Mexico per year, $10 billion economy per year, so we approach them, as I mentioned before, uh, with the science, with these uh, convincing numbers, and they were really aware of the problem they have. So we're bringing them a, a solution here. Uh, so they say, okay, yes, let's, let's do something about it. Um, there is an hotel association in Cancun, in Puerto Morelos, in Rivera Maya. They are well organized uh, along the coast. And they found that uh, having a trust, which could give transparency to the system, transparency to the use of funding, could be a, a good idea. And also having an insurance, uh, which is also a, a, a way of uh, securing and transferring the risk. They understand about insurance because, I mean, they use insurance against hurricanes and other risk as well, no? Next. Um, so I, I think, um, the, precisely, uh, uh, we're still working on the development of the trust. We're still developing, uh, De developing the insurance, uh, we are working on that, but they are uh, pretty much on board, as I mentioned, and I think that we have been able to develop this relationship with them because we were focused on, on this asset, on a problem that they were concerned. Um, they, um, we promote the instruments that they know, I mean, trust and, and insurance are, are instruments that they have been used here in Quintana Roo and many places of the world uh, commonly. Um, and we have, we have the data, hard data, and we were, we're talking more of, with them like coastal engineers. They are using coastal engineers all the time because they have this problem. So we we're not talking with them like conservationists or naturalists. So we we're talking about uh, as another co uh, consultant to them. Uh, and also we are saying this, uh, um, okay, we're having this solution, this financial instrument, we're also building the capacity, we are all in, doing other things to have because one important point was okay you have the money you have the insurance or you have the trust but how to invest that money so we are also parallel to that we are building the capacity we have developed some tools and guidelines and we are going to be uh, training people in how to use all those instruments so at the end it's a comprehensive approach 
that they can they can use. And so in one of the pilot projects, I mean, beginning last year, uh, we were in alliance with specific hotels so they can test the approach of restoring the reef. So uh, I think we are in a good uh, partnership right now. Uh, we hope uh, soon we will have the trust established and with the participation of the hotels. It will be a state trust that uh, will have participation of precisely TNC, the science community, the hotel industry, and that pretty much, I mean, that will be the, the participants in, in these trusts that will be managing, not managing, financing projects in the coastal area. Um, so that will be it. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Fernando, for your presentation and sharing your experiences um, in this webinar. And um, I would now um, open the floor for another round of questions. And since we are still more than 100 participants, um, I would like to ask you to use the chat function. And only if you're connected by a smartphone or mobile device and can't use the uh, um, chat function, please lift your hand and we will see uh, a range um, you to be unmuted. So on the right hand side you have a little box and um, in the control panel and um, there you can type in your questions and um, it will be seen by the organizing team and we will read them out loudly. So just some moments some for everyone to type in the question. Okay, thank you very much. I think uh, this is the moment to start with the first questions. The others can still go on and type in the questions in the little chat box on the right hand side. Um, so let's start. Um, the question, sorry. Um, this would be a question from Jingjing. Jing. I hope I pronounced it correctly. Um, Fernando, how would you deal with the potential pollution during your EBA measure? The potential what? Pollution. Ah, yeah. Uh, parallel to that, given that there is concern about water pollution there, and there are two, two issues. One is that the restoration itself can be can, can, can grow the corals despite the pollution. I mean, we have several examples of uh, reproduction already happening in the area, even with the current condition of the water. Um, so the, we, the hypothesis that is that the genotype is resistant to certain ways of pollution. On the other hand, there is already a new treatment plant in the area. The, the hotel owners and the particular the homes are being connected to the new the system. Um, so there is a, a whole effort happening uh, alongside, but we want to make sure that even if we don't hook all the homes, because not all of them are connected, uh, still the corals that we are replanting and reproducing will be uh, resistant to the new conditions of the water. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. Another question, how is the mechanism protected in case of extreme event, for example, hurricanes? Yeah, precisely the, the insurance. I mean, we uh, we are proposed to buy an insurance, and, and we already designed the mechanisms. It's a parametric insurance uh, that is commonly used uh, to reduce to transfer risk. If a hurricane hits the area, it's a polygon, and we already uh, assess that category four and category five five hurricanes are the ones who damage the reef, and all the restoration work that we could do, and there will be an insurance to pay out. To recover that and you can do a lot after the hurricane i mean go and clean the debris clean uh, consolidate the, the broken corals 
and, and reduce the damages that the hurricanes generally cause. So the insurance will be the answer for that. Okay, thank you. There's another question. Is there a national or local policy instrument enabling the establishment of the trust or is it 100% volunteer? The contribute okay. The the state the government is going to create it through a decree. Uh, the contributions to the, um, the to the trust uh, is a is a tax that is already uh, in place, uh, paid by the hotels and by the, for the use of the coasts. And the idea is that tax, which is now used by the municipalities, be transferred to the trust. There are some regulations that, that uh, mandate that as a percentage of that uh, tax, um, and that's the source of law at the beginning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And another question. It sounds like they had an easy time convincing tourism operators. Um, sorry, the question. Well, we have a uh, sorry. <laughs> we have a bunch of questions, so it's bouncing around. Um, It sounds like they had an easy time convincing tourism operators to take interest in EBA, but from what I understand, hotels facing threats often don't see these risks. Was there any particular reason they had an easy time convincing the uh, the hotels? Yeah, maybe I, I put it like uh, nicely in the presentation in, in terms of easy time. Yeah, hotels already were worried about the beaches. I mean, they didn't care about the reef at the beginning. I mean. But when they understood the relationship, it was like, okay, let's do these trusts that are going to, to manage and to finance beaches and reef. So uh, the, the whole thing is beaches and reef. Uh, the whole concept is beaches and reef. So they are very well uh, in, in the board. When we propose a project, okay, this reef restoration project is going to protect your beach. Okay, let's go and finance that. But we always have to have this combination, beach and reef. Uh, which silently, scientifically, is so easy to prove. So, um, but we are, always have to mention beach and reef, beach and reef, <laughs> as you can see maybe at the, from the beginning. So it's more like a marketing kind of thing. I mean, yeah, they were not worried about the reef. They were worried about the beaches. Okay, thank you very much um, for this. Um, one further question. I think um, we have time for, yeah, some some minutes left for one question. Do you have any data comparing areas where coral reefs have, pro uh, have proved protecting the coastal areas during the same kind of storm or extreme events? Yeah, we have uh, several documents um, that are published. I mean, I can share with you later um, when we compile the science from the area. And so we did a big compilation of, of data for, for the um, back with scientific papers. And a final question, could the project make changes in public policies to include EBA actions in the fight against climate change? But, but actually that's the final goal, that actually by demonstrating that a natural system reduces risk and getting the finance systems in place, and I didn't mention the national system, the national from then, the national is trust, I mean, this is a federal trust to finance risk reduction, funding risk, uh, natural systems, that will change the whole federal policy on that. And CONAMP, for example, the way they sell their, their biodiversity, instead of selling, yeah, birds and corals, so I'm selling you a service to the nation. So, yeah, yes, we, the next step further is, yes, changing federal policies towards natural systems that reduces risk. Obviously, not all systems do that. But many of them do that, like wetlands, and you know, you know, and we know here that uh, many natural systems reduce risk. People is really ready. I mean, governments and private sector is in re ready to invest to reduce their own risk. Millions of dollars are actually right now being being invested in reducing risk. We just need to to find a way to to demonstrate that and show how to do that and and build the channels to canalize those funding. So we are really enthusiastic about this uh, approach. 
Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Fernando, for your answer on this as well. Um, I think with this um, most, where well, there are some repeating questions, but I think with this um, most um, questions have been answered. And um, also thank you very much, um, Fernando, for your um, input and for um, for yeah, sharing your experiences. With this... Yeah, thank you. <laughs> With this, um, I would um, like to move onward and give uh, the floor to my colleague Andrea Bender, um, who would share with you a bit uh, the learning trajectory of the international EBA community of practice regarding EBA finance. Thank you very much, Alexandra. So as already mentioned, um, my name is Andrea Bender. I'm working as a junior advisor to the Global Project on Mainstreaming EBA. And last year in August, we had a meeting or workshop of the International EBA Community of Practice. We met in Bangkok for the second time to exchange experiences um, from implementing EBA measures and discussed further topics. As a result of these discussions, the international EBA community of practice derived so-called learning briefs. You can find them online on adaptationcommunity.net and I'll present you right now some of the key messages um, of the learning brief on financing ecosystem-based adaptation. So some of the key messages were that public sources such as national funds strengthen institutions and ensure consistency, but are generally not sufficient to cover financial needs. Therefore, we are also working on the publication um, just presented by Tobias Hunsai and um, further private sector engagement in concrete EBA implementation and upscaling is key and requir requires involvement from the very beginning in order to sustain the engagement of the private sector. I think the example of Fernando mentioned um, this really good and there are further examples in the report which will be published in April. Um, and maybe a final key message, the development of innovative financial instruments such as the insurance screen just presented, should be apart from local priorities and consider technical and institutional, financial, commercial, and legal components. Okay, thank you, Andrea, very much for this. this. Do you have anything else? No, it's fine. <laughs> okay, sorry to interrupt you. So uh, thank you very much also for sharing um, uh, the availability of the learning brief of the International EBA Community of Practice, um, which is a network of um, yeah of representatives from government, from think tanks, policy advisors to exchange knowledge and experiences on different topics. And this is also in this context that we're organizing this webinar um, series. And with this, we come to um, to an end of this webinar thank you very much to you for your participation as announced previously um, the recordings of the session will be made available on adaptation community net there is a sub page on eba and there you will find all webinar um, recordings and uh, short movies um, there will be another webinar on financing EBA measures where we will give the floor to practitioners mainly from Asia to present their experiences. It will be it is scheduled for next Wednesday 7th of March um, and you will get the invitation with the link soon. Um, further to this, um, we opened on the member space of the International EBA Community of Practice, we opened a discussion group, a virtual discussion group, which allows you to exchange um, and to discuss with um, fellow colleagues um, your experiences on financing. And um, if you would like to engage in these discussions, please send me an email so I can forward you the registration link and um, also to, to yeah, give you access to that group. Also, if you would like to present your experiences in one of um, the webinars, please feel free to approach me and we will see how we can arrange this. Um, after this session, there will be a short questionnaire um, to get a feedback on this webinar and we would be very happy if you could just take some seconds and, um, and um, yeah, fill in this questionnaire. With this, um, 
Thank you very much for your participation on behalf of the Global Project Mainstreaming EBA and looking forward to see you next time on 7 of March in the second webinar on financing EBA. Thank you very much.